I heard you speak when I was early in development of my film. And what you were talking about was the process of making your first feature and the rejection that you had faced. And in the face of that, using that as material to work against. But I imagine that where you are now, you're not facing the same barriers. I'd say the challenges of filmmaking um, have lessened in the sense of at least getting an audience for finances, at least finding creative partners. But nothing mitigates the challenge of making life on screen. Mm. That is the most beautiful challenge of all. And that must continue to remain a challenge. I feel a sense of greater assuredness, for sure. I know what I'm doing. I also know the tricks of the trade mm. and I know what will create this and that. I know much more than I did when I began. but. Still, the, the, the particular epiphany that can happen, even if you fake it into happening or you make it into happening, that is our task. And honoring your intuition, mm -hmm, because I mm -hmm. think at the end of the day, mm -hmm. really sticking to your voice and knowing, mm -hmm. one, what that voice is, mm -hmm. and two, when something feels wrong. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. really having the kind mm -hmm. of presence to say, oh, that's right, that's unexpected, mm -hmm. and yes. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> yeah. One thing that uh, one has to learn in any work really, but especially the work of an artist who makes cinema that reaches and by its very privilege of cinema reaches millions, you've got to be able to work beautifully with people. My work is to make others bloom, to make everyone bloom. Even the executives must bloom <laughs> in the sense that they are smart but they will hand you, as you well know, reams of notes. Yeah. And if you follow the notes, God help you. And if, but if you look at the notes and if you see what the problem is, what their intention is, and you find a way to what I call alchemize the notes, to creating an entirely different solution, which in our case in Queen of Cutway, and in many cases, but in this case, it was remarkable that these notes and these interventions constantly pushed my brilliant editor, Barry Brown, and myself mm -hmm. to alchemize that problem or those problems and actually find superbly interesting cinematic solutions, even for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We created a kind of almost new style of cutting for ourselves, way deep, like three months, four months into the cutting. And the film became so much richer and so much more original for it. One keeps learning, one keeps, uh, and one must always be a student of life and cinema. How do you define your role as a director? A director must have something to say and must have a vision of how it should be said. And at least for me, I like to be with people who take me much further. I don't like yes people. I don't like people who hang around, look busy and do not much. Mm -hmm. I like to really, I get excited by people who take me further, whether it be in costume or whether it be in acting or whether it be in cinema or whether it be in editing, or any, any department of it, of, of life actually. Yeah. So, but the key thing is what are you saying as a director and why is it, why should it be even said? And why you? And why you? But that doesn't occur to me much because I usually originate my own work. But when I'm offered other films, as I am, uh, that, that's my first question. Can anyone else make this film? Mm -hmm. And that is a real test for me. How do you know when an idea is right for a film, right? Because there are ideas that could be better as an yeah. essay or better as a short, better yeah. as dinner, dinner conversation. Yeah. And then once you know that an idea is a film, how do you decide, is this worth making a feature? Is this worth two to five years of your life? When I come upon an idea, I usually find myself talking about it. And in the yogic way, if you talk about something, you're honoring it. Mm. And when I find myself honoring it, even to myself or maybe to others, then I know it's sort of speaking to me in a consistent way. 
I've adapted several books into films mm-hmm. from the namesake by Jhumpa Lahiri yeah. to the reluctant fundamentalist to Vanity Fair by Thackeray and uh, with books it's more palpable because like namesake I made because I was suddenly hit by the first loss of a parent mm-hmm. in a country that was not her home mm-hmm. and we had to bury her in the snow it was in that moment of melancholy and grief that i happened to read jumpa's book the namesake in which a parent dies mm-hmm. in this country and i just felt like i had found a sister in the world and literally i read it on a plane and the plane landed and i phoned her i had to have met her once and 9 months later i was shooting that film the new film i've just finished is called queen of cutway it's a true story of a young 10 year old girl who sells corn for a living who is one day taught how to play chess and it's very quickly seen that this 10 year old is a prodigy in chess a prodigy who's illiterate and she does not have a roof on her head or a meal that's coming or certainly no school in sight it's sort of what my life stands for i've, I've always believed that um if we don't tell our own stories no one else will tell them and and certainly living in africa as i do in uganda as i do it is astonishing to be surrounded by the power and the dignity and the education of a country uh and 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 yet not have that many storytellers of the in the cinematic world mm-hmm. to be able to tell that story so that the notion and the image of africa as a continent and uganda as a country is just n- nothing to do with the reality that exists so it has been a big part of my life is to make those stories to be told but but told by the people who live them do you feel like your projects also choose you definitely that's the lucky time when you feel the privilege of inspiration i always say um never do anything as a stepping stone to something else but do it fully and completely and only at its fullest will it reveal what you should do or the rightness of things like the genesis of monsoon wedding came out of an odd thing i was developing about 2 years i spent all my savings developing a very ambitious uh film set in sort of the movie industry of bombay over decades kind of film and raised 8 million dollars for it and i looked at this thing after just before shooting it and i decided it was just not good enough mm. and i put it aside and i returned the money the first time i did that and i felt like i was sinking into a depression that i had never i didn't i never been depressed in that type of way and in that moment i was in a highway in bombay and it was a traffic jam and i was just like getting fuming you know that i couldn't get to wherever and at that moment i saw 200 indian women in white sarees guffawing madly as they crossed the highway towards the sea and i thought what is going on like felini was dead and gone i mean this is <laughs> what happened and i got out of my taxi and i followed these women and they were holding placards that said world laughter day and i ended up looking at this thing it was a convention of people who take laughing seriously there were these phenomena called laughing clubs of india i was so bummed out in life that i decided to stop everything and make a documentary so i ended up uh, for one month you know making uh, portraits of people who take laughing seriously and then as you go home with these people from these clubs they meet every morning i slowly have be- realized that they've all come to it through some sense of acute loss mm. either a suicide or a parent's death or a 90 year old friendship or whatever and i made this free wheeling thing called the laughing club of india in the monsoon with indian film songs because of the style of the handheld camera and in the rain that was the genesis of what then became monsoon wedding mm. and then 10 years now after monsoon wedding i'm now taking monsoon wedding the stage musical to broadway which i am directing now that's the passage of inspiration yeah. you never know when it's coming it's like so amazing to understand like how it could the genesis could have been 200 women guffawing madly in a, or even a film highway falling apart yeah really or a film falling before apart before that, that's right <laughs> in fact it's a film falling apart yeah and then it seems like it's also about staying open enough yeah. that 
in that taxi, feeling frustrated by traffic, yeah. that you follow yeah. those women, yeah. right? Yeah. And that when you follow those women, you say, okay, I was supposed to be doing an $8 million movie, yeah. but yeah. my story now yeah. is, this. is this. What do you do to stay open like that? If you're not open to life, then you have nothing, you know. But I think, you know, for me, I... Uh, I enrich myself, you know, consistently with family, with 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 my very um, clear devotion to, you know, knowing where my roots are. You know, I'm from India. I live in East Africa. It's because my roots are strong, I can fly mm -hmm. anywhere. I use my distinctiveness as my calling card. And sometimes it's confusing. Sometimes you're neither here nor there in the Indian context because I'll never make a Bollywood film. And I'm really not cut out to making films that, as I said here in the Hollywood context, that other people can make, which is which means Empire. like 90 percent, you know, <laughs> of these films, you know. Right. I made Vanity Fair, which is largely about a wider world than I live yeah. in, because it was my favorite book when I was 16 years old, because it was about a badass girl. You know, mm -hmm. it was about a girl, Becky Sharp, who who just knew how to cut through the, the BS of the world and who, who had a plan. But of course, it was interlocked with empire and the colonies. And that's where I thought that I would have a real special voice mm. to that saga. The different stages of making a movie require different parts of your brain and different aspects of our social being. Mm -hmm. What part of the process do you enjoy the most? I have to enjoy pretty much every aspect of it. There's nothing I really hate or anything because otherwise you won't do it well. Yeah. If you don't love what you do, that's the only sort of foundation for any kind of excellence that you could or may aspire to. But while shooting is the most difficult of it, it is the most critical of it. That moment of, of harnessing the inspiration that is existing in front of you. And it is that is the true task of a director, is to make sure that you leave really no stone unturned and, and follow the instinct to do new things that you may not have thought of before. The thing I really enjoy a lot, because it's about creating a kind of alchemy, is editing. Mm. Because in the editing room, you're not fettered by anyone at least initially, yeah. uh, and and all, all the crowds have gone home and all the noise is over and you and your brilliant editor th then have to make it work, you know. And of course, in that process, as you know, it, it leads you to several other ways of thinking, which mm -hmm. you did not know in the beginning. Are there people that you always work with, producers yeah. that you always work with, or is it project specific? How no, do you... I'm, you know, I learned again early on that it is very... Uh, beautiful to have a creative community and it's a very moving and necessary thing you know and I really regard myself as a very rich person because of my relationships being now at an average of 25 and 30 years old filmmaking is so tough that whenever I find people who again can take me further but also can have a like-minded sensibility mm -hmm. I cherish that I honor that and we both had the great fortune to just work with David Oyelowo. Yes. He's the lead in both of our films. Yes. Um, how do you how do you go about casting? I am a very uh, I never forget any performance that I've seen. Mm. I'm just like I'll never forget a name or a performance. David, I just every film I saw him in he disappeared into it in the most marvelous of ways, you know, whether it be Lincoln or whether it be Last King of Scotland or whether it be Paperboy or Incredible. the bravery yeah. in his performance. And the fact that even physically he, like literally, you it's can't valuable. recognize him yeah. from one to another. Also, I really loved that he didn't, like, he is a movie star and he does look like a movie star, but he doesn't look like a movie star, you know. So David struck me for his extraordinary sort of ordinariness mm -hmm. and malleability too, but, but mostly the power of his work, I mean, yeah. because it just kept going. So it was David from the get-go. I saw the Harriet, the mother, as a young mother courage, which mm -hmm. was written for Lupita. And both of them, fortunately, really like responded within minutes, literally, to the script. Something else that is incredibly important is mm -hmm. focus mm -hmm. as a director. Yeah. How do you maintain your focus? Focus is also born out of love. You know, when I love something, to make it something to come alive in a story, or then the focus comes with it. But 
It's also about, well, a couple of things. One is that I don't write alone. I don't, you know, I need I need people. I, I know my li- own limitations. So mm. the focus is also born out of the partners, you know, that come with me, you know, because otherwise if I were alone, I would get stuck in a way of thinking that would really almost destroy focus at the mm. end of it. Oddly enough, something I practice uh, through the sets and through shooting and through my life, which really probably promotes for me a strength and a and a stamina and focus is is a is a very classical form of yoga called Iyengar yoga it's a very rigorous practice of something unchic and classical and it keeps literally the body strong and the harmony flowing within it so it de-stresses the 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 stuckness that can happen so often you know and it just helps me in many ways but primarily with focus and with stamina it also i used to wonder you know in the indian philosophy we talk about detachment and yet retaining passion and i never understood that how can you be passionate and detached and yoga and the practicing of it for now almost 20 years teaches me that physiologically mm-hmm. like i can be detached and observe a situation slightly more than I always can if I was deep in it. It taught me, for instance, on the set, when I was much younger in Salaam Bombay, I mean, I had no support and whatever. I didn't lose my cool very often, but I would sometimes Mm -hmm. because it was just too much, you know, for whatever reason. But I found very quickly, like, that to lose your cool just expends so much energy Mm. that then you have to find elsewhere or make up for in other ways. And it's just, there's no point. Because now as I get older, I also know that creative energy is not limitless. Yeah. You know, it has to be conserved. That is a very strange seesaw mm-hmm. that I've learned only from years of practice, you know. And, uh, and you really need it in the film world, you know, because if you're constantly in the storm of the teacup, mm-hmm. you're never gonna get a good cup of tea. It's a real joy to be able to sit down with you and talk. Thank you, Maris. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting me, and I hope this helps somebody somewhere down the line. <laughs>